Should I put my glasses on? Should I put my glasses on? Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Corn Wildlife Trust Force Wildlife Management. I'm Cheryl Marriott, and I'll be chairing this evening. And um, we've already done three sessions um, like this. We've done one on badgers and bovine TB, one on hedgehog conservation, and one on our work with farmers. And those are all available on YouTube if you've missed them. Um, and this is our first marine themed one. Um, these events are all about you, our members and supporters, and keeping you in touch with what we're doing. We'd love to hear where you're watching from. So please post that in the chat. And the idea for this evening is to give you a broad overview of our work on restoring Cornwall seas. We'll hear from all three members of our core marine team. That's Ruth Williams, the Marine Conservation Manager, Matt Slater, the Marine Awareness Officer, and Abby Crosby, the Marine Conservation Officer. There's time for questions between the speakers and at the end, so please ask your questions in the chat as we go along. We probably won't get to them all because we've only got an hour, but we will look at them all and they will help to shape future events. So if there's lots of questions and comments about a particular area of our marine work, we'll, we'll try and have a specific event um, because we'll know what you're interested in. So our first speaker is Ruth and Ruth's gonna give us an introduction to ocean recovery, um, how the work that Cornwall Wildlife Trust has done in the past has created change. Um, so over to you, Ruth. Cool, thanks Cheryl. I'll just share my screen and hopefully all should is that viewing properly. All okay? Cool. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, so like Cheryl said, this is the, the first Marine Wildlife Matters event that we've had. And, uh, and the three of us have been tasked with sharing a massive topic with you. So we could really spend days discussing all of our work and our plans for, for marine recovery here in Cornwall. So tonight is really just an introduction to the state of our Cornish seas, what we think needs to be done to help them recover, and to give you a bit of an overview of the work that Cornwall Wildlife Trust are already doing towards restoring our seas, as well as some of our um, aspirations for the future. So even for those of us who live and work near the sea, we sometimes need reminding of its awesomeness. And whether that's from walking on the cliffs and watching peregrines soaring and seals playing in the surf, or from a favourite of mine, snorkelling on the, the eelgrass, particularly down on the quiet Helford, and watching anemones swaying and crabs going about their daily business. Every time I go into the sea or go near it, I'm always blown away by, by what I see. We really have an incredible diversity and wealth of marine wildlife here in Cornwall. It's, it is awe-inspiring to see it, but also it provides us with, with so many things. It provides us with the food that we eat, with all sorts of resources. It's a massive carbon sink and it moderates the climate. And crucially, um, the sea also provides us with every other breath that we take. And yet many of the animals and the habitats that support them um, are under increasing threat from, from us, from human induced pressures. Things like pollution and poor water quality, things like disturbance from an ever increasing use of our seas, from development and from the destructive impacts of fishing. Um, this is an extract from the soon to be published Cornwall State of Nature report, which shows some really stark data and trends. I think the link will be put up in the, the chat so you can, you can download this when it is published. And that report shows some really key declines in many species, including salmon and eels. It also shows that in 2019, 104 seals were found entangled in fishing net. And from the 245 dead dolphins and porpoise that washed ashore on the Cornish beaches, 27% had died due to bycatch in fishing nets. And we all see litter on our beaches whenever we go down and, and walk on the beaches. But did you realise that local volunteers removed 80,000 kilograms of rubbish in 2019? And that's, that's equivalent to 67 small cars. And that plastic is, and litter is a, a never ending source. So we need to do something to, to try and um, mitigate that, to try and help to protect our marine environment, but also to help it to recover. But what do I mean by recovery? I guess that's the first point. 
So put quite simply, recovery is about giving nature the space and the time to enable it to recover and thrive. And this can really be achieved through a number of processes. So it can either be through active restoration projects, things like seagrass reseeding or salt mass restoration. But these, those sorts of active restoration projects can often be very costly. They're often initiated on quite a small scale. Um, and we need to think about a bigger, longer term projects as well. They can sometimes achieve great results, particularly in sort of real ecologically and carbon rich habitats. But crucially, they really need to be in the right places before we start. Places where other impacts that have already been addressed, things like any water quality issues or fishing pressures must be removed before we can start that restoration project. Alternatively, the other way to help restore our seas is to look at more passive measures. So things like removing the pressures that impact that particular habitat or area to allow nature to, to recover itself. We, we can't fence off the sea the same as we can in land to manage it. But in the marine environment, it's, it's got an, in, an incredible capacity to recover if the pressures impacting it are removed. So things like um, removing or banning bottom toed gear um, can have a massive impact. And that's been shown in all areas of the, the world, but Lime Bay has shown a real, um, re real rapid and great recovery since that fishing gear was banned in uh, 2008. And there's loads of evidence around the world from, from similar recovery. Um, and I'm happy to sort of talk about some of that later on if anybody would like to hear more. You may have heard a lot recently about nature recovery and the trust's plans for, for growing nature nationally, but also here in Cornwall. And nature recovery networks are a key part um, and a key element within the current environment bill. So the aim is to, to better connect nature and to give space for recovery. And that's, that's great, that's really very much needed. And Cornwall are one of five areas nationally that are piloting the development of a local nature recovery strategy. Um, and like I said, that's, that's admirable work, but the current environment bill doesn't include the marine environment per se. It's, it's plans for the local nature recovery strategies stop at mean low water springs. So where do our seas fit in? How do we recover our seas? Well, in the marine environment, we already have a network of protected areas for wildlife. It's the marine protected area. And this, this map shows um, the marine conservation zone element of that, but there's also European designations on top of it. And in UK waters, these marine protected areas cover an area about the size of, um, or nine times the size of Wales. And that's, that sounds pretty impressive, doesn't it? That's, that's a huge area. And within Cornwall's inshore waters, we have 34% within marine protected areas. You may have heard the, the trust and the global campaign that we're striving towards 30 by 30. And that's, that's trying to get and work towards getting 30% of our seas protected by 2030. So if we've already got 34%, does that mean that we're ahead of the game? Um, sadly not, because when you look at the detail, only 7% of those Cornish marine protected areas are actually delivering protection through active management measures. Things like bylaws that can directly control the damaging activities. And that's represented by that tiny little slice where there, there's marine life in it um, compared to the, the big barren blue. So most of our MPAs still have no management in them whatsoever. And they're just kind of currently just lines on maps. So designating its sites isn't enough. We have to effectively manage them to reduce those pressures. And that's the only way that they're gonna be allowed to recover. In addition to that, most marine protected areas are also multi-use. So some activities can continue and a lot of people don't realize this, but as long as they don't, those activities don't impact the specific feature that that site is designated for, um, it, they can continue. So it's really crucial that the marine protected area network that we've got at the moment includes highly protected marine areas. These HPMAs that some of you may have heard about. These are sites where all extractive activity and all distract, destructive activity has been banned. Um, and again, I can explain more about HPMAs later on. We as a trust really fully support the, the development and the designation of highly protected marine areas and believe that they'll be really invaluable tools, both to monitor and show how different marine habitats can actually recover 
and that evidence can be used to roll out and, and showcase um, the benefits of marine recovery elsewhere. We really hope that, that Cornwall um, can see some pilot HPMAs in, in the very near future. But marine protected areas only protect specific features within their specific areas. And we really have to consider the gaps, the areas outside those marine protected areas and think about wider measures, particularly for, for species that are more mobile. So some, some management of the wider seas is already being delivered nationally through things like marine planning, through licensing, through fisheries management, and working towards delivering good environmental status through the marine strategy that we've already got. But these, these pieces of legislation and this work hasn't been designed for recovery. And some of the work is painfully slow, if I'm honest, and relies far too heavily on political will. And to allow recovery, we really require changes to legislation or policy in several cases, and that holds everything up. So this has to change and we really need to be more proactive in putting the environment first. Um, we need to have the environment at least equal to economic and social drivers if we're to see real recovery at sea. And obviously that last one, we can all help by our local action and choices too. We can help to reduce the amount of plastic entering our seas by simple personal choices to reduce what we buy at source. We can buy our fish from sustainable sources and Matt will uh, talk about our Cornwall Good Seafood Guide later. And we can raise awareness of the consequences of actions and encourage positive behaviour change. So all of these things we'll talk a bit more about later on. So in a nutshell, to restore Cornwall seas, we need to ensure proper management of our marine protected areas as well as using some of these tools that we have to sustainably manage the wider seas. So it's about reducing pressures where we can and letting nature recover, but where appropriate, also lending a, a lending hand where active restoration projects might be needed. So um, what are Cornwall Wildlife doing to, to help achieve this? Well, as hopefully you'll hear tonight, almost all of our current marine work is working towards restoring our seas and the wildlife in it. Um, our monitoring and evidence collection underpins all of the marine work that we do. We educate on key issues such as reduction of disturbance. We work on developing better fisheries management through various projects, the Cornwall Good Seafood Guide, and my work on the, the Cornwall Inshore and Fisheries Conservation Authority. We actively campaign and advocate to get our marine protected areas better managed. And we respond to development consultations to minimise impacts where possible. And all of this work really makes a difference and is helping to, to restore our Cornish Sea. But a key point that I want to make tonight is that we all need to be more proactive and more ambitious to make further changes for recovery rather than just protecting the status quo that we've got at the moment. Um, Matt and Abby will explain in more detail in a sec about how our work and projects are really helping to restore our Cornish Sea. But as a proud Cornish girl, and I know that Cornish people are, are passionate about where we live, and we're also real doers. So Abby will talk a bit more about the communities and individuals and how they can help. But it is inspiring to finally see that government and advisors are, are recognising the importance of working with people now to, to undertake action, to, to not only recover, but to rebuild our, our whole ecosystems on land and at sea. One of the key documents for nature recovery the Natural England's um, snappily titled Building Partnerships for Nature's Recovery Action Plan outlines the need to work with people and to undertake the action needed to protect and restore nature. Um, humans are part of our ecosystem and so they're key to human recovery. Cornwall Wildlife Trust are uniquely placed to act. We're the only NGO working specifically for Cornwall's wildlife and crucially, we work at all levels. So we work right down from on the ground, collecting the data and working with communities to influence strategic decisions and decision makers right at the top. So we're, we're the only one working for wildlife through all of those levels. And we really value our membership and all of those that take part in and support our work. So thank you, all of you out there. You're really, really needed as we, we can't do all of this work without you. And hopefully tonight I'll show you the range of our current marine work and some of our aspirations for how we can all help to restore Cornwall seas. So I'm going to end there for now. Um, if there's any specific questions, I'll answer those now and then hand over to Abby to tell you more. Okay. Thanks, Ruth. Just had to unmute myself. Crumbs, you think I'd be used to it by now after a year. 
Um, Joanna Reed has asked what the different colours on the map of Cornwall's MPAs mean. Um, oh, now you're asking. I'm gonna <laughs> uh, possibly the different tranches. They were. I have to go back. She's asking: Are are there differences in environmental impact between them, or are there different activities allowed in each colour? There's the yellow are um, the border ones for Wales, so you can ignore those. They're not relevant to us. Um, the the Pink ones are tranche um, one and two, and the blue ones are the ones that came in in tranche three, two years ago. So it's, it's a matter of timing then rather than- Yeah, yeah. Else. So yeah, ignore the colors, they're all designated now. Um, one quick other question, then we'll get, move on. Um, Tamsin Keeves asks, do local leaders, for example, Cornwall Council have the power to make decisions protect our local marine environment or are we reliant on national government decisions? Good question. Um, it's a little bit of both to be honest. Um, we need national legislation and that's key um, to managing a lot of the land and sea um, under various bits of legislation. So we've got the Marine and Coastal Access Act, um, we've got the Fisheries Act which has just come in at the end of last year, the Environment Bill that's, that's hopefully going to come out soon. Um, and nationally, we really rely on the licensing process. DEFRA get the, the last say in all of our bylaws um, and um, local legislation. So yeah, national um, government has got a real strong hand to play, but the County Council do have a role as well. And I think that role is probably gonna strengthen um, in certainly in coming years under the environment bill when it becomes an act. Things like the local nature recovery strategy um, it's going to allow Cornwall Council to, to initiate projects and draw down more funding, um, which can be used to then resource and implement some of these nature recovery projects. So I think, yeah, there's, there's going to be um, new bits of work that the Council will lead, but uh, unfortunately all, a lot of it will sit underneath that national government legislation and regulation. Okay, thanks. So it's a bit of a mix of both. Okay, we'll move on to Matt then. Matt's going to talk about some of our projects, uh, particularly monitoring projects where we're gathering data on marine species and, and monitoring them over time, and also our work on promoting sustainable fisheries. So over to you, Matt. Right. I'll just share my screen a minute. I'll go back to the start, sorry. Okay, right. Good evening, everybody. I'm Matt Slater. I'm the Marine Awareness Officer at Cornwall Wildlife Trust. And, um, you know, I just feel incredibly lucky to be based down here in Cornwall, uh, working on marine conservation, which is obviously, you know, it's such an inspiring place to be, Cornwall. We're surrounded by incredible marine life. And I'm uh, going to be telling you a bit about some of our great projects that we run to monitor and protect our seas. So, first slide um, you know many conservationists feel that um, and talk about fishing as a threat but actually you know fishing is really important and really vital to Cornwall not only culturally historically but also economically and um, fisheries are actually a very efficient way for us to get protein and as long as fisheries are well managed the seas are really really productive places and so really we, um, we feel it's, it's very important to be working together with the fishing industry. Now, just as we work with farmers on land, we feel that you know, going forwards, if we're gonna see um, good, good outcomes, we need to work with fishermen as well. And actually, when you, when you think about it, we've got an awful lot in common with fishermen. Obviously, fishermen need a healthy sea for their livelihoods, and just as we would love to see a healthy sea uh, for thriving wildlife. And uh, yeah, based on that, we, um, we really feel we, we do have an awful lot in common. Now, um, fishing is a complicated topic. And when I started at the Wildlife Trust, we were constantly uh, getting members of the public and, and members of the Wildlife Trust asking us for advice on seafood, what seafood to eat and what not to eat. And it is actually a really complicated subject and it's hard to communicate this. 
and um, we've got 13 different methods of fishing being used in Cornish waters and our um, fishermen are landing over 60 different species of seafood so it wasn't surprising really that people were confused so what we decided to do was to actually help people make good decisions and obviously some methods of fishing are far uh, you know are far more sustainable than others and we think that actually in Cornwall we should really lead the way in, on fisheries management and sustainability but we really felt that people were in the dark and and this um so this project has really helped people um, educate people. So we set up um, a brilliant website, the Cornwall Good Seafood Guide, and I'm hoping some of you in the audience will have, will have visited it. And basically what we did is we brought together all the information that you needed into one place so that everybody, whether you're just um, you know, a member of the public who's interested or if you're a business person, can easily access quickly the information you need to make your own decisions and to make sure you're being as sustainable as possible. We've proven that there was a need for this because since we've set up the traffic to our website has just grown exponentially. And um, this year we've had our busiest year ever. We always get at least 4,000 new users a week. And in 2021, last February, we had our uh, busiest month ever with 29,000 users to the website. Now to calculate sustainability it is complicated. And at an early stage of the project, you know, we consulted with the industry uh, closely and thought long and hard about the best way of actually presenting this complicated subject. But in the end, we decided rather than create our own method, we would work with an existing and well-respected method. So we actually um, used the method that was devised by the Marine Conservation Society. And some of you might have heard of the Good Fish Guide, which, which is a great project. It's been around for a long time. And, but what we did is we applied that method to Cornwall's fishing industry in far more detail than was ever featured before. And as a result, we're able to really highlight some great um, sustainable local seafood and re really much better represent Cornwall's fishing industry. So, um, so by doing this and by highlighting best practice, we hope to continue to influence improve fisheries management. We're highlighting a lot of gaps as well in the science. Really, we need to know a lot more about our seas before we can make some of these uh, decisions. And there's a lot more research is needed. During the lockdown, our website was um, served a, a, you know, a vital purpose because we were able to highlight local fishermen who had lost their markets because of the restaurants shutting down and exports freezing. And uh, we were able to put lots of local people in touch with their local small scale sustainable fishermen, which was a real achievement. And during that time, we, we had um, 69,000 users of the website, which is amazing, just in the first lockdown. So yeah, many of our fisheries are really well managed, but there's still um, room for a lot of improvement. And behind the scenes, as you heard from Ruth, our marine team is doing a lot of great work, um, working with IFCA, that's the, um, the um, Cornwall Inshore Fisheries and Conservation Authority, also working with, um, with the academics and with the fishing industry. And we feel that there's um, a lot of ground to be made um, and we're hoping that this, this project will really give um, consumers the confidence to continue supporting fishermen. So um, we've also got some great projects. And as you heard earlier, you know, um, we're calling for people to get involved. And um, we currently run five different um, projects, which are citizen science projects. And uh, as they get up to some really exciting stuff all around the county. One of the biggest highlights for me um, running the shore search project was the day in 2015 down at Castle Beach where this tiny little hermit crab was found by one of our volunteers and it turned out it was a species um, called Clibonarius which hadn't been seen in Cornwall for 40 years uh, so that was very exciting and this is a warm water hermit crab which has now become pretty abundant all around the Cornish coast. Um, it's its larvae presumably drifted over from Brittany or the Channel Islands and uh, and now it's it's really becoming well established. So this citizen science project allows us to monitor our marine environment and pick up new uh, new things, new trends that are happening. In uh, Cornwall we are, have an incredible uh, underwater life and one of the things that's often very underappreciated is the incredible diversity of seaweeds. 
and our volunteers go out and record this. And it's amazing. We've got 400 species of seaweeds in Cornwall, approximately. Uh, so there's always something new to discover. Our volunteers as well uh, out on the shore have um, been central in alerting, uh, you know, the the government to a, new, uh, an, a massive increase in this non-native species. So these are Pacific oysters. Some of you will have seen these attached to rocks all around the south coast of Cornwall. And, and growing up as a lad, you never used to see these. Now they're they're really abundant. In fact, there's been a population explosion that our volunteer groups have been monitoring. We trained 17 groups to go out and carry out surveys and the data they've collected is gonna be really vital in the control of this species, which we're really worried about is really changing the whole nature of our uh, ecology within our estuaries. Uh, and this is what happens when, when they get out of control. This is a, an oyster reef in the Foy estuary, uh, completely changing that habitat, which was once a sort of soft, muddy bank where birds and fish would be foraging for food. It's now a hard oyster reef, very, very different and very sharp as well. There's been some good news stories though in the last few years. So another project we have is um, Sea Search, which is a national project uh, run by the Marine Conservation Society and in Cornwall it's delivered by the Cornwall Wildlife Trust. And we train divers to go out and record the wildlife they find and an amazing uh, site in the last few years has been the recolonization of Cornish waters by crawfish. This is a spiny lobster which was heavily fished back in the 70s and 80s. In fact, in many areas it, it became pretty much extinct. But in recent years, it's been turning up on dive sites where it hasn't been seen for, for over 40 years. And we, um, um, yeah, we're really excited to see them and welcome them back. We really hope that management for this um, species in terms of a fishery that's that's now uh, really uh, building rapidly um, will prevent it becoming overfished as it was back in the uh, back in the 80s and we've seen some pretty spectacular big <laughs> big animals as well in local waters recently and you know a lot of you will have heard about the the bluefin tuna which are staging a comeback they're, they're doing really well in, in, in our waters and they're being attracted in by huge shoals of sardines, which are also doing very well. And this is really encouraging and it really gives you a sort of little flavour of what our seas are capable of because bluefin tuna hadn't been spotted in UK waters since the sort of 1930s. And we've had humpback whales. So it's, it's really exciting. You never know what's going to come up next. Humpback whale sightings. This one's in Mount Bay. They've been a regular occurrence now since 2015 and um, no one would have predicted that. And the number of sightings has really been going up. So back then in 2016, there were six sightings. In 2020, there were 38 sightings of humpback whales, which is really, really encouraging. Sadly, though, as, as Ruth touched on, that our, our volunteer projects also do monitor some pretty pretty sad stories so our marine strandings volunteers who are amazing have been monitoring um, and recording dead animals washed up on cornish coastlines for over 30 years now and as ruth said earlier you know um, the the number of cetaceans washing up on our beaches seems to be increasing 249 cetaceans washed up in 2019 is quite a, a large number and um, our volunteers by carrying out um well, some of the some of the cetaceans get post mortemed, but all of the animals washed up get um, measured and photographed. And from uh, through our bycatch evaluation project, we can actually uh, work out causes of death. And uh, as Ruth said earlier, you know it is a worrying sign that twenty seven percent of the cetate, uh, cetaceans washed up are showing signs of uh, bycatch in fishing gear. Uh, the picture here is was taken um, not very long ago off Main Porth. Uh, a net was found with a dead dolphin in it and a, a seal. So, yeah, um, this research now has been going on now for a very, very long time, and there really is need to sort of address this. And as we said earlier, um, there's, you know, a lot of potential. Our oceans are really important, not only for wildlife, but they also lock away and, and store carbon. And increasingly, we're with concern about global heating and climate change, you know, storing carbon is going to become more and more important and um, there's many reasons why we should be protecting the sea and this is just just another one so um, 
This summer, the, through the Sea Search project, we're going to be out and about monitoring seagrass beds and looking at, as well as at how seagrass beds can recover if we remove um, mooring chains, which can scour the seabed. So that's going to be quite interesting work. And hopefully, in time, we're, we, you know, our ambition is to to really see projects that result in seagrass and other um, seabed habitats recovering and storing lots of carbon. So yeah, some great projects and. Um, you know, um, one of the things Ruth already mentioned is the, you know, the power of our oceans to really become uh, productive. We'd love to see our oceans recovering. I think the results, if we allow areas of our seabed uh, to, to, to come back and to uh, and, you know, take away pressures, I think the results are going to be absolutely outstanding. Uh, to be honest, you know, our seas have been impacted by humans now for centuries. In, in UK waters, we really have only a very small amount of areas where human activity is completely restricted. So we really don't know what, what's going to happen, but you know, more than likely we'll be absolutely blown away by the, uh, the recovery that we'll witness. And let's hope we get to see it soon. Thank you. Great, thanks, Matt. Um, got time just for one quick question. Um, Ms. Joey looks like on, on YouTube asked about the sustainable fishing guide and it needing to be constantly amended. Yes. Yeah, it does need to be constantly amended. So we, we review all of our ratings every six months. And if we find out any evidence that one of our um, scores needs adjustment in, in those in between times, we can actually bring in emergency changes as well. But that, yeah, that is one of the, the great things about being based down here, close to the fishing industry, keeping in touch and making sure that those sort of um, changes that need to be made are done as quickly as possible is, is very important. Thanks, Matt. Okay, um, last but not least then, on to Abby Crosby. And Abby's gonna talk about working with communities and, and getting them involved in marine life. Over to you, Thank Abby. You. Thank you, Cheryl. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Brilliant. Yeah, thanks, everybody. I'm Abby. I'm Marine Conservation Officer at Cornwall Wildlife Trust, and I'm speaking this evening about how all of that work that we've already mentioned this evening is happening with our communities, with people to protect our marine life. And really, you know, what makes Cornwall Wildlife Trust Living Seas work so valuable um, isn't just that incredibly important monitoring and those conservation commitments and projects that we've just been talking about, but it's the way in which the trust engages that with communities around the county so that we can all work collectively together more effectively towards ocean recovery. And as Ruth mentioned earlier, that is so important at the moment. You know, in so many of these strategic documents we're reading, um, we are seeing that recognition of the importance of working with people and through people to undertake that action to rebuild our ecosystem. So this is really relevant right now. We face many challenges and things that we need to improve and do better, on, but we also have a real opportunity and we have the real opportunity to make that meaningful change for our marine environment. So to all of you out there listening tonight, to all of our members and our followers watching, can we just emphasize that you are needed, your support is really needed, your voice is really needed now more than ever. So, oh, sorry about that. I'm gonna go to the beginning. Uh, okay. So one lead area of our conservation work within Cornwall Wildlife Trust is something called our Your Shore Network, which I hope many of you will have heard about this evening. So that was established by Cornwall Wildlife Trust in 2010. It's still supported today by Cornwall Wildlife Trust. And this map shows the 17 marine and wildlife local groups around our county that make up the Your Shore Network to date. So they range all the way from viewed all the way around to Rame um, on the southeast coast. So what that represents to us is that individually, all these independent, entirely run by volunteers, these groups are doing fantastic work within those individual communities um, and making a real difference to their patch of the coast. But together, 
they are such a powerful force implementing real change, real conservation change across the entire county. So, you know, these groups represent thousands of members thousands of voices that are joining our campaigns for better protection, thousands of hours, you know, Matt mentioned all these volunteering opportunities, which were just the tip of the iceberg, that hours of practically conserving our environment and monitoring it, and thousands of events, things they do really well, engaging with the residents and all those visitors that come to Cornwall about how fantastic and how valuable our marine environment is. So if we just take a moment to reflect on this unique, uh, network we can appreciate what a special and inspiring thing we have in Cornwall and it's a very much an initiative that Cornwall Wildlife Trust are very proud of. Now what's even more important about that your shore network is that for the past five years um, it's been supported by funding from the National Lottery Community Fund to work with and empower young people so that they can take a greater role and even a lead in protecting our seas. So that was called the Your Shore Beach Rangers Project, so there's the logo in the middle of the slide there. That was run in partnership with Cornwall College Newquay, and it ran a programme of this youth engagement work alongside an academy called the Beach Rangers Academy, which was a little bit like Duke of Edinburgh programme, so it enabled the next generation to gain you know, a plethora of skills, but also their strength as the future blue voice for our environment and, you know, for the next generation. Over 17,000 young people were engaged in the Your Shore Beach Rangers project, an incredible number. And although the funding is actually just coming to an end this March, there's a legacy and this work will continue. The Beach Rangers Academy resources are available for free online via this site called the Moodle site, Cornwall College Moodle site. If you Google that, you'll find it. We have young people that are integrated now into that Your Shore network so they can go from strength to strength. Um, and the project, and of course, as we said, the Your Shore network itself is being supported by the trust. There's an absolutely fab project video that's available on our Trust's Marine YouTube channel. So I really recommend you check it out. Now, that Your Shore network of local marine groups existing alone is in itself really valuable. So they're communities, they're ready to speak up for their local patch of coastline, but the network and those communities often also take on really impressive conservation initiatives. Now, one such conservation initiative, one such issue is, of course, uh, the issue of ocean plastics. It's an issue that unites pretty much most organisations in this county. And to tackle that issue of marine pollution, the Cornish Plastic Pollution Coalition, which is this very beautiful logo that was designed recently by the Fantastic Leap uh, design company, which is a Cornish company. So the Cornish Plastic Pollution Coalition came into being in 2016, and it started amongst the members of Cornwall Wildlife Trust's Your Shore Network. So it was felt by those key members, these fantastic individuals who took the initiative to get CPPC started, that these groups, these um, networks and other organisations could actually make more of a different difference by joining forces together, giving them more clout, lobbying um, with authorities and corporations. And it definitely is true. They've done some incredible stuff. That coalition is still supported by the Trust today. It's grown to the point where it now includes well over 30 environmental organisations, uh, of um, marine science experts, environmental and beach clean organisations. And it's a really, really powerful part. Partnership. Uh, and between them all, it represents the concerns, again, of people, of tens of thousands of people in this county and beyond. So an incredibly powerful initiative. Now, it's not just pollution, though. Conservation projects led by people and communities range. They range from seagrass mapping in Lou to invasive oyster monitoring, as Matt mentioned, over in the Fallon Helford. And even Cornwall's large charismatic megafauna are represented, you know, with communities around Cornwall looking how best they can protect these enigmatic creatures. So we're talking about the big things, the glamorous things like the dolphins, the porpoises, the whales, the seals, the basking sharks. How can we protect these top animals um, in our coastal waters when, you know, our seas are getting busier and busier? And that's where we look at the support of the Cornwall Marine and Coastal Code Group. 
So the Cornwall Marine and Coastal Code Group, that's the logo in the bottom right um, hand of the slide, is a partnership of conservation organisations and it's coordinated by Cornwall Wildlife Trust. And we tackle the issue of marine and coastal wildlife disturbance by water users. And, you know, this is massively important when Cornwall is probably facing its busiest year ever of visitors due to COVID restrictions preventing us from travelling abroad. So this project, and this project isn't just an example of conservation bodies working really well together to protect Cornwall's marine life. It's an example of people doing it. Every single business on our on and by our water, every water user, you know, private water user within this county have the ability to make changes to prevent prevent wildlife disturbance and and uh, and, and make really effective change and um, to help towards ocean recovery. So really fantastic work. This is the glamorous Amelia Bridges from the Loo Marine Conservation Group about 12 years ago. Um, and she's still involved today, which is amazing. And uh, she is modeling there our petition fish. So many of you this evening may be watching so far and realizing, okay, well, I'm not part of one of my local marine groups. I'm not part of beach cleaning group or any initiatives like CPPC. And you may be wondering, you know, how can you as individuals still support our work? How can you aid ocean recovery? And the answer is it's, it's completely possible. And by supporting the trust campaign is a really excellent first step. For instance, there is absolutely no doubt that people, every single person that put a a scale on that fish who wrote to the, their MPs, who signed our petition, played and influenced the designation, the creation and the designation of marine conservation zones around Cornwall. There's absolutely no doubt about that. That is a massively important development in marine conservation in the past decade. And it's one that the Trust, Cornwall Wildlife Trust, have been a key player in ever since the whole process started in 2009 with finding sanctuary all the way through with discussions with government. Even in 2019, it was sort of late 2019, wasn't it, Ruth? The trust were invited to sit with Richard Benyon, the MP, to discuss highly protected marine areas, uh, a new MPA um, designation, which is essential in creating a really proper blue belt around the UK and effective ocean recovery. So it's a big part of our work and we still need your support in this area. So please continue to follow us and support us with our campaigns so that together we can implement real change and how we manage and protect our coasts and seas. Now, I couldn't finish my talk without a picture of Matt Slater and a massive crab. Um, it becomes, you know, it's just standard in my presentations. Um, just to flag that, of course, obviously, the Trust leads the way in public engagement through a programme of outreach, whether that's through our affiliated local marine groups running a range of events, whether it's via our programme of activity for National Marine Week, which is uh, something that all wildlife trusts get involved in every year in the summer, or whether it's through one of the projects that Matt mentioned, you know, SeaQuest, Public Sea Watches, Shore Search, Rockball Rambles. There are opportunities for people of all ages, all abilities to join us and learn more about the sea and what lives within it. So I really hope to see many of you um, as we open up safely in the future after COVID. And, you know, when we can get and, and that, I know running an event maybe doesn't seem as important to some of the higher level policy work. But if we can engage people with our marine environment and we can make them appreciate how fantastic it is um, and raise that their appreciation, it will impact behavior change. So it is really, really important. It goes hand in hand with everything else. So joining your local marine group, supporting our campaigns attending one of our great events. And of course, I've got to say, you've got to become a member if you're not already. There are so many ways in which people are involved in conservation action and helping us to do fantastic things here in Cornwall. I must finish there, but I want to highlight, I hope you agree that what we're doing already is of immense value. We must continue doing what we're doing, but we're also looking at how Cornish communities and people can take that next step and move us even further into ocean recovery. You know, we are focusing on that and we're gonna be getting in touch. We know that our seas still need some help. 
We know what's needed to be done. We have the tools to make the starts. So we're going to start. So we need you, our followers and our members, our local marine groups, our your shore network. We need you all more than ever to speak up and keep pressure for that positive change. So you can help spread the word um, that we do need this better protection. You can link with your communities, your local marine groups. You can just act individually by making individual choices, but together we can make ambitious and positive change. And I can't wait to see it um, happen and what we achieve in 2021 and beyond. Thank you. Brilliant, thanks, Abby. Good, great rallying cry there. Um, I'll give you one question of your own and then we'll do a joint session. Oh. Questions? <laughs> um, Rich Steva, it looks like, I was asking, how can our young people make a difference? So, you know, we've been working really closely with young people through the Yorkshire Beach Rangers project, which I mentioned. And um, through that, we've been offering um, ways in which to give young people a stronger voice. Um, to, to stand up for their local marine environment, to get more involved in it. So regardless of what they do in the future, that's integrated into their being and how they feel and what they want to do in the future, whoever they're working for or working with. So we would just encourage young people um, to have that confidence to, to join us and join their local community groups, to volunteer with us, um, and, you know, they will provide invaluable skills and support to their local networks and communities and the people around them in making um, conservation action even stronger. You know, they're, they're just an invaluable part of the structure of our communities and we need them by our side in making a difference. They're the people that are going to be representing our marine environment in, in, in the future. So we need them here now. Great. Thanks, Abby. Right. I've got several questions now for, um, for the whole panel for you just to choose who, who's best place to answer them. Have a fun fight. Um, Robin Bradley um, is asking what action is being taken to reduce cetacean, seal and bird bycatch from gill nets? And can someone tell us what cetaceans are as well, please? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm happy to take that, but Abby and Matt fill in anything after. Um, we've been working to reduce bycatch for two decades, um, I think, at least. Um, cetaceans, we mean um, as dolphins, porpoise and whales. Um, and that's been the core of our bycatch mitigation work. So we've, we not only monitor the stranded animals that wash up on our beach, which Matt mentioned through our Marine Strandings Network, um, but we gather the data from the, those stranded animals through post-mortems and in situ um, on the beach to help us determine the cause of death. And we can use that data then to look into how much um, or how, you know, the proportion of animals that are being by caught and, and where. Um, and a lot of them, unfortunately, like Robin says, are in, in gill nets in our local inshore fishery. So we've been working um, over the, the course of the years with our inshore fishing industry. Um, we trialled various different pingers um, over 10 years ago and um, determined that one, the fish tech banana pinger um, actually is incredibly reliable. It's practical for the fishermen to use. Um, it's highly effective at reducing um, cetacean bycatch from gill nets. Um, so it reduces the, the bycatch by 82%. Um, and even more importantly for us as an NGO, it doesn't disturb those animals. So um, the, the animals can still feed around the nets, they're not displaced, and they don't act as a dinner bell. So that is a really strong solution to, to minimising bycatch of cetaceans in nets. Um, I also sit on the national steering group to, to determine the national strategies for bycatch of all species. Um, and and that's, that work is crucial in sort of filtering down some of these mitigation projects. Um, and there is a trial happening down here locally with some of the local fishermen to trial different mitigation devices. So hopefully that'll wrap up and, and things will roll on in the next year or two as a result of that. 
In terms of seabirds, again, there's, there's a lot of work that's being done. Um, the IFCA are um, involved in some of the bycatch mitigation work that we do. Um, and as with, with any work, it was, it's all evidence-based. Um, and so, yeah, I, I truly believe that at the moment there, there's, there, there's still a long way to go, but we have got solutions. We just need to get licensing and some political will to get those solutions in place. Super, thanks Ruth. Justin Ridgewell is asking, to what extent do you see man-made habitats like artificial reefs as a useful contribution to efforts to protect and rewild our seas? Who wants that one? <laughs> Matt, do you want to go? I'll take that yeah. one. I think we have to be a bit careful. I mean, there's the assumption that if you put something in the sea, and then you go and visit it a few years later and there's some animals living in it, then that's a success. But you've also got to look at what was there before you put the man-made object in there. And actually in some areas where you've got, um, you know, seabeds with lots of creatures living inside the sand and the mud, actually putting a man-made object there might actually result in a reduction in biodiversity. So it is quite complicated. And clearly in, in some cases, Man-made objects can have their uses, but you've got to be very careful that they're in the right place and they're the right sort of structure and it's, it's not something we should rush into uh, at all. And, and for that reason, there are lots of rules as well, that, uh, licensing requirements, etc., that, you know, that, that mean that decisions like that um, are not rushed into uh, for good reason. Um, yeah, hopefully that's Great. answered it. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, Daniel Eva. Hi, Daniel. We know Daniel. Oh, yeah. He used to be a trustee. He said this is for Abby. So he's um, oh, no. <laughs> sorry, Abby. Um, Daniel says there don't seem to be a lot of prosecutions for wildlife disturbance. Why is this? That's a really good question, Daniel. Um, OK, so the first is lack of reporting. We still have a huge issue with people actually recognising when a wildlife or well, marine and coastal wildlife crime is taking place and understanding the correct reporting process. And actually, just to tell everybody, the simple answer is call 999. If you're watching, particularly our, our marine megafauna, so we're talking about seabirds, cetaceans, which are dolphins, porpoises and whales, basking sharks and seals you know these are protected species and if you were seeing you know what what you would imagine is a wildlife crime it's best to just phone 999 and get the call officially logged now in addition to that so that's reporting there is um also i would i think and, and we work very closely with the police they're incredibly a couple of the wildlife crime officers are incredibly supportive of the Cornwall Marine and Coastal Code Partnership, but even they will agree that there is always, you know, a lack of resources uh, in some areas. And so that may impact um, the way that certain wildlife crimes can be processed if there isn't sufficient data and evidence to clearly provide it. Um, but they are very supportive and on board and they do, uh, they do investigate um, certain uh, events that are reported to them. Um, so I, I think I think reporting is the key thing, though. I think that is really, un, you know, not happening at the level that it should be. So I guess, you know, just a take home message to all our followers that, you know, be aware of wildlife crime, you know, get, become engaged with the Cornwall Marine and Coastal Co group, check out the website, sort of understand the process more. There's often a lot of disturbance sort of workshops happening, actually, at the moment. There's one in St Ives. Um, on Thursday the 8th of April that people are welcome to engage with which we're doing in partnership with the Cornwall Seal Group uh, and Research Trust um, so yeah so, so sort of read up on this a little bit more understand it more and uh, and then start reporting uh, wildlife crimes and making sure it is getting through to the police and into their official records. Great thanks Abby there you go then uh, Daniel it's, you're all our eyes and ears out there so mm -hmm. yeah, please get engaged with it. And Ben is asking, is there a good chance of Cornwall getting a highly protected marine area? <laughs> Who wants that? Is that a Ruth question? I'll take that one. <laughs> um, oh, I would like to think so, Ben. Um, we've been engaging with DEFRA. So um, the, the process so far has been that 
um, these, these sorts of highly protected areas have rumbled around for, for a long time under different guises. So we had reference areas and no take zones and various other things. Um, the, the HBMA, so the highly protected marine areas, have been consulted on um, by an independent panel that reported um, last June um, by Richard Benyon. And we were quite well involved with that. So Abby attended a local workshop. Um, we were, um, had a representative on it from National Wildlife Trust. And that, that report really highlighted that or everything that we wanted to see. We're now in the process of waiting for DEFRA to report on that report, <laughs> give their response. In the meantime, Cornwall have put our heads together. So um, through the marine conservation expertise in the county, we've drafted up um, kind of a, a very rough assessment of which local um, marine protected areas we think could work as a highly protected marine area. So they are those areas that are rich um, in, in specific wildlife, but have got the ability to recover. Um, they're large enough to show recovery um, and they've ideally got uh, good carbon habitats as well. So they're sort of a double whim, um, if you like. So we are in the process of discussing this with DEFRA at the moment, um, and there will be pilots, um, at least five around the UK, but we really don't know at this stage where, but we'd like to think that we've got the community support within Cornwall Wildlife Trust and, and the partners that we work with. We're very collaborative in Cornwall, um, and we've got you know, very good relationships with our, our managers and our decision makers through my work and Matt's work, especially we've got reasonable good links with the fishing industry. So uh, you know, we, we are well placed to be putting one of these um, pilots, HPMAs in Cornish waters. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed and watch this space then. Thank you. Okay, a quick one from Jane Trigoning. She's asking, to what extent is sewage overflow a problem in polluting the seas and beaches? Say that, Ruth? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, it's, it's still a big issue. Uh, you know, um, we have seen some improvement, but Cornwall is uh, developing rapidly. We're, we've got a lot of building. A lot of our sewage treatment works are, you know, um, pr pretty uh, at capacity. And whenever we have heavy rainfall, We've got a lot of combined sewage overflows, so water coming off um, roads and off um, towns mixes in with sewage, over overwhelming the sewage treatment works. And for this reason, we get we get sewage discharges into the sea on a very regular basis. And really, that that is unacceptable on many levels. It's it's a, a real problem for our uh, oyster and mussel farmers, for example. But we also know that the nutrients that are coming in through our rivers, into our estuaries and into our bays are also really impacting on the ecology and causing eutrophication. And um, really, if we're going to see our, our marine environment recover, this is definitely one of the things at the top of the list that we need to sort out um, on you know, many different levels. Have you got anything to add to that, Ruth? We, we appreciate it's not easy and it's expensive. But really, it needs to be high up there, doesn't it, up the priorities list? It does, yeah. Yeah, and again, it's sort of linking back to that collaborative working. So Surfers Against Sewage do a lot of really good advocacy work um, about sewage pollution and have done for, for decades um, at that high political level. And we work closely with them in Cornwall and with our politicians and the, the local managers to, to try and clean it up on a, on a local level as well and put pressure on where it's needed. Superb. Right, we'll move on to just a few final thoughts then before the end. It goes so quickly, doesn't it? Um, so I'm, I'm going to ask all of you your, your thoughts on this one. What's, what's the one thing that you would encourage our, our viewers to do for marine wildlife? What's the, some take home messages? Ruth, you go first. You go first. All right. Um, I think as well as individual change, the one big thing I would um ask everyone to do is to use your voice to try and influence decisions. I think we're, we're within the conservation sector, we're too quiet. Um, and it's often the, the negative impacts, the negative stories that, that get, get shouted about the most. And I think we, we need to change that. You know, we've got G7 down here this year. 
Um, it's perfect timing to try and tell the politicians that we want to see change. There are real benefits to everybody about nature recovery generally, but down here, especially in the sea. So, yeah, my one big thing would be to use your voice and tell the politicians what we want to see and, and help our campaigns. Brilliant. What about you, Matt? Well, I think um, it's, yeah, it, in Cornwall, we are so lucky to have so many well managed and sustainable fisheries. And we really need to support those fisheries. Eating local is important, isn't it? It's a it's a low, it's a good way of managing to minimise your carbon footprint. You know, we shouldn't be eating seafood that's been transported from halfway around the world. So avoid things like tiger prawns and avoid farmed salmon, uh, and support local, well managed, sustainable, low impact fisheries. And actually, we are we are spot for choice. We've got many of them in Cornwall, and. Um, yeah, if you're going to eat protein, I would I would look out for for local sustainable seafood and, and look at the, the website Cornwall Good Seafood Guide. Brilliant, thanks, Matt. So if you if you are someone who eats fish, not everybody does, but if you are, use the Good Seafood Guide. Yeah, That's a good one. Abby, um, I guess linked to my talk, I would say for people to get involved in one of their local marine groups or you know or even a, just a local wildlife conservation group within their communities that might be a plastic free community or it might be a sort of climate action group um, but obviously I'm going to advocate for the local marine groups that we support um, and it may be you know that you just attend their events and show an interest and learn something new or it may be that you can offer social media skills um, or be the admin or you start you know doing pacific oyster surveys just there's so many different ways you can get involved with your local group and just being there and interested is always a great support to them so that's what I'd recommend. Thanks Abby I'm not sure that was one thing but we'll let you ask. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, get involved. Get involved. Get involved okay good right last last thing then um, there's a lot of doom and gloom around um, let's have some of your reasons to be optimistic for Cornwall's seas. What, give us some reasons to be cheerful. Ruth. Okay, um, I think the the most optimistic thing I can think is, is the sea's innate ability to recover. Um, it can sometimes feel a bit of an uphill battle making conservation change. Um, but, you know, since I've been involved, you know, in the last 20 years, I've seen a huge change in terms of marine conservation. So many things have happened. And I think the there's huge optimism for the next decade, but the next decade is going to be crucial. And um, I think, yeah, I'm really optimistic, but we do need to be really dynamic, really proactive to, to shout about it and try and make real change. But yeah, the sea can do it if we give it a chance. Ruth, Matt? Well, I think um, a reason to be optimistic and cheerful is you know we, we should all appreciate stop and appreciate how lucky we are we should all try and get in the water as much as possible and just appreciate and look at our marine wildlife you know spending a bit of time to stop and watch it you'd be amazed at what you'll cut what you'll find and and we are so lucky you never know what you're going to find if you go rock pooling if you go snorkeling if you go diving in Cornwall uh, and you know I've been doing this my whole career and you know, I see things all the time that I've never seen before. And uh, that's amazing. Matt, Abby, a reason to be optimistic? Well, it's almost linked to what Matt says. So then I kind of want to say two things. So linked to what Matt says is that I, for me, it's people's attitude towards the sea. I think that people really appreciate it. I think we've seen more of that in the last year when people have depended very much on our environment um, for their health and their mental and physical well-being and I, I think that's just so positive it's really empowered me seeing how much people care from all over the country from all different backgrounds and different communities how they care and uh, I think that's really positive because if we've got that we can actually do some really great things I'll actually I'll just say that <laughs> perfect thank you um, no more questions you're all off the hook no pun intended um Thank you, all our panellists, um, and thank you to our members and supporters watching. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you get a, you've got a good idea of the work that we're doing. Um, as I said, we'll look at all your comments and questions and use that to steer future events. So keep an eye on our social media um, so that you're informed about what we're doing next.
Thanks, everybody, and have a good evening. Thank you.